Uh, today we're pleased to welcome uh, Lem Shepard for our presentation of African American musicians in Kansas from 1860 to 1920. And our program today is brought to us by uh, Humanity Standards, which is an independent nonprofit and learning nonprofit leading a movement of ideas to empower the people of Kansas to strengthen their communities and our democracy. So take a moment to turn off your cell phones so that we may all enjoy the program. And as we begin, let's remember that the information presented, as well as what we share and discuss, is of value and of interest. And we'll respect one another, even if we have different points of view. Now that we're in agreement, let's get started. Lem was born in Kansas City, Kansas, and by the time he was nine years old, he was frequently playing guitar with the Sons of Kansas City Blues veterans. In 1999, he was nominated by a congressional co committee to represent the state of Kansas in a solo performance at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. He composed and performed the soundtrack to the PBS documentary, Black, White, and Brown, has received awards from the Kansas Folklore Society, the Oklahoma Blues Hall of Fame, and was a national finalist in the Telluride Acoustic Blues Challenge. In addition to becoming an accomplished musician, Lem is also an accomplished lecturer. In 2017, Lem received the Mer Meritorious Achievement Award from his alma mater, Pittsburgh State University at Pittsburgh, Kansas. So please welcome me in welcoming Lem Shepard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is my pleasure. Such a great crowd. This is so thrilling. Uh, and tell you what I'm going to do. First, I'll talk a little bit about this history, and, and then I'll play some songs for you. And so usually I didn't want to bring PowerPoints because I didn't want you looking up there and taking, but if you, you want to ask me questions through the, my program, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question or anything uh, about me. And I always like to start out showing this poster. It's kind of jolly wobbered in there. But this is, this is a, a poster from a show that toured Kansas. It's called Bandana Land. And this is a, a very popular show uh, from 1909. Um, and, you can, and you can see the, the two men here. Basically, this was what we used to call a minstrel show, except for they're not wearing blackface. And then this was one of the first eras that uh, these two musicians didn't do that. And, and why this is important, it's because this guy here, Nash Walker, is from Lawrence, Kansas. And they traveled all over the world. He's one of the most famous uh, vaudeville performers in the world. Uh, he grew up in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, Alex Rogers was, was a songwriter. He was living in Emporia, Kansas. And Will Marion Cook is undisputedly one of the most famous African-American musicians of the modern era. Mm -hmm. And he was part of that. He actually uh, mentored a lot of people in Kansas. He came to Kansas, had long extended stays. And this is what, what got me started because I thought, you know, this is 1909. So I wanted to know whose shoulders did they stand on? And I'll give you, so I'll, I'll paint a little bit of a picture for you about Kansas because when I first started doing this, uh, it's a, nobody knows this about Kansas. About, uh, so I always like to use the, the, the show Gunsmoke. We've all watched the cowboy shows about Dodge City and Gunsmoke. So during that era, there was a, in 1878, uh, there was an African-American dance and a, a band called the Houston Raw String Band played music for African-Americans. The dances and the music that they played Bonnie Blue Flag, Arkansas Traveler, The Girl I Left Behind. Those are like bluegrassy songs. But in those days, everybody played the same music. Uh, in uh, 1879, in Kinsley, Kansas, there was a black literary society. Um, the Fisk Jubilee Singers uh, came to Dodge City in this area in around 1873. And that kind of spawned everybody in Kansas to put together their own group of, of singers. Um, there was a black dance hall in Dodge City uh, in 1883. Um, and, but you don't see that on, you don't see that in the cowboy era. Uh, there was Kelly's Opera House, 
uh, all the African-American touring companies would come to Dodge City. Or they, wherever there was an opera house and a railroad, all the famous uh, touring artists in the world came to Kansas. Uh, in 1893, in Abilene, African-Americans put on Beauty and the Beast, a play. So that's kind of the background of African-Americans in Kansas. And in 1897, and I saw these figures printed twice. Uh, some of them kind of vary, but uh, African-Americans own 767,000 acres of land valued at $1.2 million in the city and town property that African-American, this is in South, they said in Southwestern Kansas. So it's around here, uh, valued at $900,000. And so that gives you some numbers of the number of African-Americans that they were in Kansas. And even the number of African-Americans in Kansas was pretty close to that of Maryland. And Maryland was kind of a significant place in the East, maybe 17,000. And since we're going with numbers, I'll give you what I call by the numbers. And by the numbers is, is kind of a list that I put together of, I started counting, I started counting everything. There were 56 named African-American string players in Kansas from 1859 to 18, 1922. And I always, I always stop in 20s because you notice that the program, I went from you know, 18 this to 1920, because the 20s were the well, jazz age, it was the modern age. By then, you know, it was like all bets were off. Everybody had jazz bands. Uh, people didn't need to see as much live music anymore. There were electric lights. People were going to the movies now. Uh, so the live music thing was sort of on its way down and more, more people were just going to, there was even somebody gave a gramophone party. You know, like when you would listen to music at your house, that was a big deal. You'd, Somebody bought a gramophone and some records and so they didn't need to go see the live music anymore. They would just go to someone's house and listen to records. Uh, there were 38 uh, banjo and mandolin guitar clubs. And that was, these were, they called them clubs in those days. You know, there were a group of mandolin players, a group of banjo players, and they called them, because when you said the word band, like today, you know, you go see a band. Well, a band was just brass instruments. Uh, 100 and 26 African-American quartets uh, from 1880 to 1922. Sometimes a quartet could be four singers, sometimes it could be a banjo, mandolin, a couple of singers. There were 60 black trios. These are three people, could be three instruments, could be three vocal, but they would always say, you know, the, the, somebody's the political campaign rally and there was an African-American trio there uh, playing music in between speeches. Uh, there were 60 glee clubs. Uh, we think of glee clubs as these things that happens in schools and colleges. Uh, 1876 was the first African-American glee club in Kansas, and there were 60 of them. 21 uh, black brass bands, 1866 on. Uh, 67 string orchestras. There were 47 home talent minstrel shows. And once, the, once these guys traveled through Kansas in the 18-whatevers, every town put together their own group of African-American showmen. Uh, it, and Ellsworth, Kansas, uh, in like 1888, had a group called the Afro-American Concert Company, and they put on these shows. There were 50 professional Jubilee singing groups traveled in Kansas. Uh, they came every year. There were 75 uh, African-American minstrel shows that toured Kansas every year. So when you think about it, if you have hundreds of groups hundreds of local groups, uh, and one uh, article I read, it said that you could go out five, six nights a week in Kansas at the Opera House and hear African-Americans' music. Trios, quartets, uh, the famous vaudeville shows, local musicians, uh, it was that active here. Uh, 79, this is an interesting number because from 1864 to 1922, there were 79 African-American literary clubs. And uh, Ida B. Wells, she said the beginning of this was in 1892. But in Kansas, black literary clubs began in 1864. And Atchison, Kansas had eight uh, African-American literary clubs. And at one time, it was said that African-American women were the most literate single group of people in the United States. 
because of these literary clubs, people self-educated. And I think the most important number that I found, and of course these numbers have grown, because I keep doing the research, you know, the numbers have grown, is 250 publicly owned halls and privately owned halls between 1862 and 1922 where African Americans could perform. Uh, if, and I, I didn't count the ones where the, where the famous guys came and played at the hall. I just counted the ones where the local African Americans had access to. And there was, there was over 300 of these halls all over Kansas. It could, be a, it could be the library, it was a courthouse, it was an opera house somewhere, but all over Kansas, wherever there was a railroad and there was an opera house, uh, you had these things, literary clubs, poets, uh, musicians. And I think that was the one thing that may have set Kansas apart from the South in that African-American literary societies, because they had to meet somewhere, you know, there's eight of them, so they could rent a hall for like maybe $9, or even the bands, the, the orchestras, they had to meet somewhere. So they had access to public facilities. And I think that was a major thing in Kansas that perhaps they didn't have in the South in 1860. And so that's it, I think, and I, you know, I don't have enough time in my life to research every single state in the union to see if they can mirror this, but I, I, I have an idea that Kansas was a little bit different because of the railroads, because of early settlers, uh, abolitionists, uh, union army generals and officers, uh, you had African-American troops, so, and you had people leaving the South coming here, and they always say the first wave of immigrants are usually the most able uh, like we talk about the exodusers who went to Nicodemus and Captain Matthews had interviewed them. He's a very famous African-American uh, military officer from the Civil War. And he says some of them had $1,000. You know, some had hundreds of dollars. That was a lot of money. You could buy a farm with $1,000. So those were the numbers that, that set the stage. So when I first was going to do this, I thought, you know, why don't I, uh, why don't I just take 15 famous Kansas musicians like Eva Jesse, who I had a chance to meet. Uh, she was George Gershwin's uh, choral director, and she's from Coffeyville, Kansas. And Will Marion Cook saw her when she was 12 years old, and she was able to arrange some music for him when his, uh, this, this show here traveled in Coffeyville. She was the only person in town in 1908 who could copy music. So he encouraged her, and he followed her to her college, and when she got out of college, she said, come to New York. So I met her when I was in college, and she was like 89 years old, and people say, what was that like? And I said, the first thing she ever said to me, she pointed her cane at me and said, button up that shirt, young man. <laughs> and she said, don't ever wear those sneakers around me again, <laughs> because she was from the old school where you wore black slacks and a white shirt every day. Because she said, you never know, you never know. Somebody could be auditioning someone you know, around the corner and you gotta be ready to go, go to that audition right now. Uh, there was Ernest Hogan, very famous, you know, African-American uh, vaudeville singer. Alex Rogers, Nash Walker, a guy named Jess Jones. We don't know a lot about him. He lived during this period. He actually wrote Shake, Rattle, and Roll. Uh, there was Levi Payne, very famous band director. Um, he traveled all over Kansas. Uh, he worked for Barnum and Bailey, all the big circuses of the era. Uh, there was P.G. Laurie. There was a Vance family, uh, Vance Laurie. Uh, Glenn Laurie was one of the older ones. He was a very famous cowboy. Uh, when Glenn Laurie died, they were from Reese, Kansas. They said the entire range mourned his death. Uh, he had been a ranch boss in New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas. Uh, but he, there was a, the Laurie family was very famous. They had a lot of musicians in there. Neil Clark Smith, uh, Buck Clayton, uh, Lorenzo Fuller Jr., who was called the voice coach to the stars. So this is a generation of Eva Jesse. They were born in the 1880s. So that was a sex. So I wanted to go back before, these, before these, this group and back before that group and find out what was it about Kansas that inspired this 25-year period of African-American <laughs> excellence. And, and so instead of those, those uh, 15 names, I came up with and you know, I, you're not gonna be able to read all this, but these are the names of the musicians that I found in Kansas. I have three pages of you know, 12 point type, single space, just names of banjo players, guitar players, uh, trombone players, band directors uh, that were known, and they were all in the newspapers. You know, when something would happen, they would put them in the newspapers. So I thought, if I just did those 15 names, what about this list here says a lot more. 
that there were 50 or 60 of these guys who were very well known. And it, it really, it, and, and it's one of those things that when people, when I tell people I have this, they want me to, to do something on what they call the black string tradition in Kansas. And I want to tell them, even though I have this list here, there was not a black string tradition in Kansas. There was an American string tradition in Kansas and African Americans took part in it. It's just like during the cornet band period. You know, we talk about cornet bands and how many cornet bands there were. There were bands everywhere. There was a 50 piece Mexican band that traveled through Kansas during 1888. Uh, Wichita, Newton, Kansas, they traveled all over. There was a Native American band, uh, probably Denison Wheelock. Uh, he had a band in, uh, finally, in Haskell College there in, in Lawrence. So there were Native American bands, there were Mexican bands, there were German bands, there were black bands. They all played the same music. And you can find a list of songs they played because everybody did the same dances. They did a dance called the Shatish, which I have never seen, but I like saying that word, <laughs> whatever that is. But the list of songs that the, all the bands played were based on dances that people did. So that's what got me thinking about when you think about American music tradition, there wasn't like a group of African Americans doing this thing and a group of the, the, the Hispanic band playing Hispanic events. They played every event because you wanted the best band and, and at one time they were considered the best band. So you got this 50 piece band that was on the road or Levi Payne's band or you know, you got one of those bands to play like when the, like in the early, when I said the, uh, the black community had a dance. Uh, the Houston Ross band was the best one. So they hired that band. So that kind of gets me to, I'll play some songs for you because that sets the stage as, and everybody says, well, what happened? Where did all that go? And so I've talked to a few scholars about it and nobody's really sure, but I think from some of the stuff I picked up on is that when they opened up Oklahoma territory, everybody left. There's this whole idea that Oklahoma was gonna be a, a black territory. They were giving this territory to African-Americans. So a lot of African-Americans from this area left to go to Oklahoma. It's actually my family went from Texas to Oklahoma because they thought Oklahoma, my father's father and grandfather, you know, they went, left Texas and went to Oklahoma because it was gonna be this new territory. And so I think a lot of people in Kansas, African-Americans in Kansas did the same thing. They all went to Oklahoma and started all those little black towns that we hear about. But that kind of drained the whole, the whole town. Well, let me see, I'll start with a, I think everybody can hear this. I'll do a song called uh, Silver Threads Among the Gold. And I saw it on a lot of lists. This song is from 1873. And a, a lot of times when African-Americans would have a program at, a, at a, a public hall and the newspaper would write down what they sang. And so I was able to gather well over hundred songs. Uh, that they were singing, and this was one of them. And this was actually the song that the guy that wrote this, uh, he said he, you know, back in those days, you'd write a song, uh, you'd sell it for $3, and he sold the song for $3, and he said he never heard the song again until he heard a Native American band playing the song, and it was probably uh, Dennis and Wheelock and his band playing Silver Threads Among the Gold. Uh, there was an African American musician in Kansas, but he wound up in Excelsior Springs mot at a motel there, hotel there, Back in those days, the musicians were like a jukebox. And he said he made pretty good money playing this song over and over and over for a man who wanted to hear Silver Threads Among the Gold in 1880 or something like that. So that's how you made money in those days. No matter what you liked, you played music that people wanted to hear. And this is uh, Silver Threads Among the Gold. Now, Darling, I am getting old Silver threads among the gold Shine across my brow today Life is passing fast away But my darling, you will be, will be Always young and fair to me Darling, you will always be Always young and fair to me When your hair is silver white And your cheeks no longer bright With the roses of the May 
I will kiss your cheeks and say, Darling, mine alone, alone, you've no older grown. Darling, mine alone, you've no older grown. Love can never more grow old. Locks can lose their brown and gold. But the hearts that love will know never winter's frost and cold. Never winter's frost and chill. Summer's warmth is in them still. Never winter's frost and chill. Summer's warmth is in them still. Darling, I am getting old. Silver threads among the gold. Silver threads among the gold. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now, originally that song is really slow. Darling, I am getting old. It was part of the whole syrupy, sentimental ballads, you know. Of course, I didn't want to put anybody to sleep, so I sped it up a lot. But that's what people, that's what that period was, the sentimental ballad. Uh, there were lots of these sentimental songs, you know, the, the baggage cart ahead was one of the, uh, behind was one of the famous ones. But there was a dance song, um, because in those days, people did certain kinds of dances where, you know, waltzes. And you know, it's kind of funny when you watch the old cowboy uh, shows, you know, there's always a piano player banging around in there. Uh, but there was sometimes these trios. There was a guy out here, uh, there was a guy named McVeigh. There was musicians out here uh, in Platt, Kingman, uh, Concordia. Um, and this, the funny way I kept up with some of these musicians, would, uh, they would get shot in a bar. And they would say, the banjo player that used to play this song was shot in Concordia or shot in a bar in Kingman. Uh, he may not survive. And there was one guy in, in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, a guy named William Bell. And he was always in the paper. William Bell played guitar around the 1880s and 90s around Lawrence in Kansas City. But he must have been, he must have been quite a character because you know, they, they said he, was, he, once, uh, he once got arrested because they said he threw a stake through a plate glass window and broke it because he wanted it, you know, he, he wanted it, you know, rare instead of well done, you know, and, and uh, or he got arrested in a fight, you know, he, he had a cane and, and he, and they, the word on the street was that even though he was blind, uh, he was a pretty good fighter. Uh, but so that's why I kept finding, you know, some of their stories or if they played at a dance, uh, he provided the music and that's where I came up with all these names. Uh, whatever musician played at the dance, they would give their name. Um, there was in Sedan, Kansas, there was a fire, a wagon caught on fire, burned all the hay, killed the horse. And they said the guy driving it was the banjo player, uh, Mr. Gilbreth. Uh, he was you know, African-American banjo player in Sedan. And so luckily he survived and they, you know, that would have been like your radio station dying, you know, if, if you lost a banjo player, because that's how important uh, these musicians were in those days. Let's see, I'll do a, I'll do Home Sweet Home. Uh, that was one that all the bands played. Uh, and this was popular, uh, 1897, uh, the Salina Mandolin Club played this song in 1897, but it's from uh, 1852. It goes back that far. Um, Payne's band played this song in around 1919. Uh, Levi Payne, and at that point, uh, bands were sort of on their way out. You know, night, some of them were sort of still going uh, 1920, but by 1919, people were dancing different. Like the old song, you know, those waltzes and things like that. People weren't doing that anymore. The jazz dancing was more popular. Syncopation, uh, Will Marion Cook, uh, he had a band called the Syncopators. You know, they called it syncopated music. They didn't call it jazz. So 
band music, marching style music was kind of going out. Uh, but that's where this song comes from. And, and we've all heard Home Sweet Home. This is my arrangement of Home Sweet Home. Pleasures and palaces I have known Be it ever so humble There's no place like home Stars in the sky would stop and make me stare But what I was looking for I had right there At home Sweet home, at home, sweet home, at home, sweet home, at home, sweet home. Stars in the sky would dazzle me in vain, what I was looking for, always had right there. What I was looking for, always had there. At home, at home, at home, sweet home. At home, sweet home, at home. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the Fisk Jubilee Singers, I always used to say choir, but they were always referred to as the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Uh, they came to Kansas in about 1873, and by 1875, most cities and towns in Kansas had their own group of Jubilee Singers. Uh, Salina had a group, T.L. Bond and his, his, his uh, singers. Uh, there was Junction City. Uh, Fort Scott had a group uh, that were called Colonel McKinney, and Colonel McKinney was a Union uh, officer, and he was always considered you know, the best singer in the West. You know, Kansas was as far west as everybody had heard of. So Colonel McKinney uh, was superintendent of schools, and he put together all the African-American students in town in Fort Scott in around 1875 and put together a group of Jubilee singers, and they toured Kansas. They were considered to be quite, uh, quite the group. You know, his group was always mentioned. There was uh, uh, Jackson Jubilee singers. They were from Quindaro University. Uh, they were a big group of group Jubilee singers that toured professionally in Kansas. And there was one story about McKinney's group. Uh, they said they played in Kansas City, and they didn't make as much money as they thought, and they had to walk back to Fort Scott uh, in October, this is November. And, you know, we think about it as being, you know, holy cow, walking. But in those days, people walked a lot. Um, so maybe they stayed with people along the way. I don't know how long that would have taken. A couple of days, a week, I don't know. But uh, people walked a lot. So that's how rough it was in those days. Uh, they obviously didn't have money for the train uh, because that's how a lot of these groups got around. And, and, and I didn't mention that that's how these famous groups were able to tour Kansas because we had railroads. Some of these vaudeville shows were 50 pieces, you know, 50 people, you know, uh, animals, show, tent shows. So we had trains all over Kansas because of agriculture, because of, you know, military, whatever reason. Uh, that's how everybody got around. And it was kind of an equalizer. Uh, a band in Fort Scott could play in Concordia or Wichita. They would get on the train. And they had these Emancipation Days. I don't know if you've heard of Emancipation Day, but it started in Kansas. Um, well, as, soon as, as soon as the slaves were released in the West Indies, 1830-something, uh, all the slaves in, in America began using this August 1st as Emancipation Day, even as early as 1840. Uh, so as soon as people got to Kansas, uh, they started celebrating Emancipation Days. And these were big celebrations. Uh, all the bands in town would play, whether it was a German band or African-American band, all the politicians would come. And there would be many, many carloads of people, uh, like even in Wichita or in Newton, if Newton had Emancipation Day, uh, 10 carloads of people would come from all over the state 
to go to that Emancipation Day. Lawrence had big ones, but every town and county had a big Emancipation Day celebration. Lots of musicians, lots of politicians. Uh, every, uh, most of the Republican politicians in those days had a pep club with them that traveled along with them uh, because they would give speeches, never be music. So that's how a lot of these songs I picked up, you know, there would be a, a, a Republican rally and then there would be music was by, you know, in those days they would say music by the colored band, music by the colored trio, but it was a group of African Americans who moved around on different instruments. So they could be banjo players, they could be violin players, they could be whatever, mandolin players, uh, they could be singers and they would kind of fill the bill to what, and they would, be, they would be paid, you know, they, were, they would be paid singers. These were professional musicians in those days. But Steal Away was one of the songs that was on everybody's list. All the Jubilee singers, they all did Steal Away. There was, because Fisk Jubilee singers did them. So there's maybe four or five songs that everybody did. And this is my uh, arrangement of Steal Away. Steal Away, Steal Away. Steal away from to Jesus, steal away, steal away home. I don't have long, I don't have long, I don't have long to stay here. Away from Jesus, still away home. My Lord, He calls me, He calls me by the thunder and trumpet sounds in my soul. I don't have long. No, I don't have long. I don't have long to stay here. Still away, still away, still away to Jesus. Still away, still away home. Green trees are bending, poor sinners are trembling, and the trumpet sounds in my soul. I don't have long, no, I don't have long, no, I don't have long to stay here. Still away, still away, still away to Jesus. Thank you. Let's see, I'll do a, a banjo song. You can't really bring a, a banjo and not play it, you know. <laughs> This is, this is an old banjo. I, sometimes I, I bring it to places and, and sometimes the sound man wants to, you know, they want to get it tuned up and I'm telling them, this is kind of a hundred year old banjo, you know. You're not gonna get it in great tune like these modern banjos, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna check it again. This is a tenor banjo. That's close enough, as they say. But uh, the, the banjo players in Kansas, you know, sometimes they, uh, they switched 
like there was a guy that used to play banjo, then he played mandolin, and as the guitar came, they played guitar. Uh, there was a banjo player in Lawrence named David Taylor. He went by the name of Napper. Uh, sometimes he went by Colonel Hancock. Uh, he was so old in the 1880s or 90s, uh, he said he remembered his master telling him that George Washington had died. Uh, they said he died in Salina, or, or he said he was 115 years old. Uh, but he was always, of course, always in the paper, you know, they felt sorry for old Napper, you know, as he got older, he couldn't play that well, but he was still this, this icon uh, around Salina and Lawrence. And, and one time they said when the, uh, the James brothers came to town, uh, they would flip him silver dollars uh, to play their favorite song. And so that again leads you to know that that's how these guys made money, uh, by playing whatever the popular songs were. So whenever the James Brothers were around, uh, they would look up Napper, wherever he was playing at, whatever bar he was playing at, David Taylor, and he would play banjo for them. And of course, that would have been a, a pretty good living, you know, uh, playing music for the James Brothers. But he played for all the events in the street. And that's something else I found that in the eight, there was another guy in Atchison, Kansas. He played banjo. Uh, and they said that he, he played banjo as long as people did a certain two-step dance. Uh, and as he got older, uh, the dance style changed and he couldn't get any work anymore. So he took to uh, catching minnows and selling minnows on the street. And they said he had a, a funny way of borrowing money from people. He would say, I'm fixing to go down to the river and catch you a mess of catfish. And so if he said that to you, he meant he needed some money. Uh, he's gonna, you know, he'll bring the catfish back with him. But he was very well known as a banjo player in those days. And the most important thing about him was that some of the songs he played, uh, I found out that they were part of bluegrass tradition in the 1940s. Uh, there was a song he played called A Stump-Tailed Dog is a Good a Dog as Any in around 1888. And when I read that, I thought, you know, people named songs in those days so they could remember the melody. And I said that enough times to myself, and it came out to, uh, we fired our guns and the British kept a coming. <laughs> and so I looked up that, I got on the internet and looked up that song, and sure enough, there was a guy in 19, who traced it to 1940, and it sort of sounded, you know, like, <laughs> something like that. It was, and most of the early banjo songs, you could put your hand up here, and just one finger, you can stop the song, like all the banjo songs. Because in Africa, you didn't really fret instruments down here. You made African instruments like the banjo, it's a type of harp. And so you, like Amazing Grace. And so you, you can play Amazing Grace on the open string of a banjo. And so when I started learning banjo, people wanted me to frail and do all the fancy stuff. And I said, I'm gonna think about my left hand up here and I'm gonna play as many songs as I can without moving it. And I came up with all these banjo melodies, which were the older, older melodies. By 1880, uh, most of the banjo players in Kansas were, they're not playing anymore. They had moved on to, you know, something else. And fiddle was always, you know, the instrument from the early days of Kansas. Fiddle outpaced banjos by a wide margin. Uh, in the Wakarusa Times, uh, they had an article, it was kind of a fiery editorial and they were complaining about these pro-slavery men coming to Kansas with their symbol of uh, black violin players or black fiddlers. That was a symbol of the South. So even from the early days of Kansas settlement, black fiddlers were here. And some of these old guys like Napper and uh, there was a guy named Rolla Isham, uh, they may have been part of that whole group of, of black fiddlers that came to Kansas. So even by then, uh, the fiddle was the instrument. Uh, when the, the vaudeville shows put the banjo back out there, it was part of the 16th, 17th century. Uh, they were kind of introducing people to this thing that happened a long, long, long time ago. But most of the, uh, most of the African American musicians who came to Kansas, the vast majority of them were fiddlers. And that's why I found more fiddlers than anything until the mandolin and guitar took over. But I'm gonna do a Roll Jordan Roll, which was another song that all the uh, Jubilee singers in Kansas, whether they were from Fort Scott or Concordia or Junction City, they all played this song. And it's a banjo song because, you know, that's the melody of the song. Roll Jordan, roll, roll Jordan, roll. When I die, one go to heaven to see old Jordan roll. Hey brother, you should have been there. Yes, my lord, sitting in the kingdom to see old Jordan roll. Surely hear the 
words I say, let your days be long. Roll Jordan, roll, roll Jordan, roll, roll Jordan, roll, roll Jordan, roll. When I die, I want to go to heaven to see old Jordan roll. Hey, sister, you should have been there, yes, my Lord, sitting in the kingdom to see old Jordan roll. Roll Jordan, roll, roll Jordan, roll. When I die, I want to go to heaven to see old Jordan roll. When I die, I want to go to heaven to see old Jordan roll. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'll do Walking King uh, because that's a, that song has been around. I think Lou Rawls sang Walking King. Jerry Lee Lewis sang that song. Uh, it, went, it went back to the 1880s. Uh, James Bland and it's, the interesting thing is I've been doing um, African-American music, blues and jazz and studying all these people, you know, in history. And then I came to find out they all came to Kansas. Uh, and, you know, one of the reasons that I think was also unique about Kansas, uh, like eventually, like the Fisk Jubilee singers at one time, uh, they were denied accommodations uh, in, I think, Topeka. This was like in 1880 something. And they were just surprised. They were put out and they said, we've been traveling to Kansas for 25 years and had always gotten first-class accommodations. Uh, and of course, in this, and somebody said, well, well, what do you do in the South? And they said, we don't travel in the South because we can never get accommodations. So that, I think, was why so many African-American musicians in Kansas had access to all this music. It's because Kansas was a place, going back to the 1870s, where all these touring groups could find accommodations. They, were, they could get on the train. And there was also a book written by a guy named Michael Campbell. I think he was Sir Michael Campbell. Uh, he wrote a, a journey in black and white where he traveled through Kansas on the trains. And I think I, I, think I found his book. I think I bought a copy of his book, of that book. Uh, it's, it's like an old rare book. But he traveled through Kansas in the 1880s and he said he found that African-Americans uh, had pretty good accommodations on the trains. He, he found no segregation in Kansas in the 1880s and 1870s. Uh, so they could use halls. Uh, if there was a show, they could all go. So they had ex exposure to, and not only that, but some of them left with those groups. And that's why there's so many uh, famous people uh, that are from Kansas, because as these shows travel through Kansas, uh, they needed a banjo player, they needed a singer. Uh, there was a, a guy in Junction City uh, called Charlie Divers. Uh, and it is funny, it is a sad story was that a, a group came through, his wife was a good singer, and she left with the group. And they said he was, Charlie Divers was so sad, or, you know, this music, he had a music store. And eight years later, the show came back through, and uh, they reunited after, after this long period. Uh, one of the towns had a, a, a singer that sang with the Fist Jubilee Singers. Uh, you know, so the Fist Jubilee, Jubilee Singers would come through, they need a singer. Uh, and so Kansas also had great education, uh, schools, uh, music schools, lots of people were starting uh, music schools. Uh, I once read that some of the African-American women who were cooks in some of the people's houses learned, they started taking piano lessons because they figured out they could make more money teaching piano <laughs> than they could cooking. So they started taking piano lessons and then they started music schools themselves. So the access to teachers, access to schools, access to you know, instruments, uh, made Kansas this unique little place just for a 50 year period though. It was just like 50 years uh, that it had all this and it sort of, the modern world sort of took over, I guess, a lot of other things. But this song here, Hand Me Down My Walking Cane, was one of those songs that, from that period that stayed alive for, you know, a hundred years. Hand me down my walking cane. Hand me down. Oh, my walking king, hand me down my walking king. I'm leaving on a midnight train. All of my troubles been carried away. Job I'm working, sure is getting rough. Job I'm working, sure is getting rough. They want me to work a little bit harder, but I'm working hard enough. All of my troubles been carried away. Hand me down my walking cane. Hand me down, oh, my walking cane. 
hand me down my walking cane. Oh, I'm leaving on the midnight train. All of my troubles been carried away. There's a light shining down the road. There's a light shining, shining down the road. There's a light shining down the road. Here comes somebody, help me carry my load. All of my troubles been carried away. Hand me down my walking cane. Hand me down, oh my walking cane. Hand me down my walking cane. I'm leaving on the midnight train. All of my troubles been carried away. Thank you. Let's see, I'll try to get through, this is a song I, I don't do a lot of ragtime guitar playing, but I have to try to get through Georgia Camp Meeting, because a lot of history in that song. There was a guy named, named Will Ruffins. Uh, he, well, yeah, he came through Kansas in 1899. And I used to hear blues musicians always talking about, you know, uh, how they rolled the blinds. And his, he said he rolled the blinds from Cuba to New York to Kansas, and I always wondered what he meant by that. But it turns out that that's the blind baggage. You know, when you ride where the conductor can't see you, you're riding blind. And he stopped off in Wichita, and of course in those days he was playing music on the street, and in those days you couldn't play on the street without a, a certificate or some kind of permit. And that was so the, the police would take you downtown to the courthouse and arrest you and make you pay a fine for $10. And it turns out that's the best thing that ever happened to you, because you got your name in the paper, and sometimes the judge would say, hey, play us a song on that thing. And the next day in the paper, you'd hear Will Ruffins, you know, banjo player, guitar player. And then everybody would ask you to come, come out to the park and play or whatever. But this is that song, uh, Georgia Camp Meeting. It's about camp meetings that took place all over. Was a camp meeting Saturday night, way down in Georgia. Folks were large and tall, big and small. At this Georgia camp meeting, when the church let out all the people did shout. They were so happy, but the judge was down and he said aloud, all the rest. When that church let out, all those Sunday hats were thrown away. That's a little bit of that ragtime song there. <laughs> well, hey, does anybody have any questions? Because I, I want to do maybe one more song, and, and then um, anybody have a question for me or anything uh, about? Yeah. What are some of your personal favorite blues artists? Wow, let me think. Um, the first I have to be Lightning Hopkins. Because I remember listening to Lightning Hopkins and not quite being so young that I didn't quite know what it was I was listening to. And it was very simple. He was an improvisator, you know, he just would kind of go on and on and on. And he played acoustic guitar. And the more I learned about him, he, he really played electric guitar more than the acoustic. But in those days, they commercially photographed him playing an acoustic guitar. And he was really an urban sounding guy, but they marketed him as an acoustic player. Uh, so that's so I learned a lot about the history of the music and, and how m people move around and he traveled around and how his influence, you know, and his lineage back to Texas and uh, and how modern he sounded. But even though he had to market himself as a country player, but he yeah, he was one of my early influences. Well, let me do one last song for you. This one's called Adam. And it kind of began the whole journey for me because Eva Jesse. Uh, the song that I think that she might have composed or transcribed for Will Marion Cook was this song because I heard her play it at a festival and I didn't know where this song came from. I'd never heard her play it before. Uh, we had rehearsed a lot of other material and then during the, it was the Kansas Folklife Festival like in 1982 and we had rehearsed a show and then she, she took a break and she got up on stage and played this song and I couldn't believe where this song came from and I didn't know anything about it. But I always wondered, was that the very song that Will Marion Cook had her transcribe when she was 13 years old. 
And it was, you know, from 1908, but it was still being played in the 1950s and 60s. It's called Adam. <laughs> Young folks were talking in the house the other night about Adam and his scriptures long ago. Women folk all abused him and said he wasn't right. Of course, the men folk said, yeah, that's so. I felt sorry for Mr. Adam. I felt like putting in. Cause I know more than they know about what made Adam sin. Adam never had no dear old mommy. Take him cross her knee and teach him the things he ought to see. I know down in my heart he would have left the apple bee. But Adam never had no dear old mommy. He never had a child life round the cabin door. Never really had a child life. And what's more, he started out a great big old man. Never had the right kind of wife. I know down in my soul when the sinning did begin. She'd have come and told him, Adam, that's a sin. But Adam never had no dear old mommy. Take him cross her knee, teach him the things he ought to see. I know down in my heart he would have left the apple bee. But Adam never had no dear old mommy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, hey, this is my pleasure, and this is fun for me. I get to do a lot of new songs, different songs, because I've been playing blues and, you know, traditional blues and electric guitar for so many years, and so it's just a thrill for me to research my own, you know, instead of me playing music from the South, now I have songs I can play from that were played around Kansas. I have a whole Kansas history of blues and folk music. So thank you all very much. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know Chance has got a question, and he's not a hesitant Yeah. What country what? How long have you been playing music Oh, man, let's see. See, at my, at my age, we sort of started at nine years old, you know, because the guitar was like a toy, and everybody got toy guitars, you know. There were cowboy guitars, Mickey Mouse guitars, Roy Rogers guitars. So I got one as a kid at nine years old. And then by the time I turned 10 or 11, there were guitars all over the neighborhood. But I didn't get serious about it until I was tw uh, maybe 16. And then by the time I was uh, 18, I decided I need to learn how to play guitar, <laughs> you know. But I had a lot of natural ability. I always tell people I was lucky because my father had a bait shop, so I could have strings <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so I used to go to Catfish Line and string my guitar up, and one of my sister's boyfriend, my older, I had five older sisters, and one of their boyfriends played guitar. So he was going to impress my sister and play my guitar. And he was tuning this thing up and tuning this thing up, and it never tuned up. Because I told him, well, those are catfish. That's catfish string. That's not guitar strings on there. <laughs> so he was so embarrassed. He said, beat it, kid. You bother me. <laughs> but yeah, it was a toy for me. Born in Kansas City. Yes, Kansas City, Kansas. How long did you live there? Oh, I, I lived there until I went off to college at like 19, maybe. Um, Trying to think, did, did you know any musicians there? Or, because I, I think Lawrence Wright was the big deal in those days. He was an organ player. I knew Lawrence Wright, the Jay Mc, guys like Jay McShan, Lawrence Wright. And I met Albert Collins was a big star at one time. And I remember the first time I met him and told him I was from Kansas City, he said, well, do you know Lawrence Wright? I said, yeah, I grew up next door to him and his family. He says, well, we used to ride motorcycles together all the time. And he lived in Canada, Lawrence, Lawrence Wright and Albert Collins played in his band. And I remember Albert Collins coming around the back door Saturday night about midnight, him and Lawrence, they had, some of their equipment had broken down. So they came and borrowed guitar strings and a drum pedal, <laughs> you know, we'll bring it back on Monday, man. And I remember looking at that guy, they were older guys, you know, we were like, I was 15 or something. And these guys were maybe 35 or something like that, you know. And they were cool. I thought, cool guys are bar line equipment, man. But it's kind of funny how you, 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 you think these guys are big stars. And I remember a time when their equipment broke down and 
I helped, I helped Albert Collins push his van out of the snow when he came to Pittsburgh. It was a hard life. So I'm glad I got to see it close up. Anything else? You spoke about black race riots. Yeah. Do you know why they go? Oh, no, no. Why? Yeah. Where would they come from? They sang glees. It was, a glee is a form of music that specifically has that historical quality to it. Oh. You know, I make, you know, because there was a book, they, they referred to one group called, they said they were going to sing silver songs. Now they sing whatever they want to sing, but when they first arrived, they had to sing glee. It was a glee. Kind of a, yeah, because I, now I know what you're talking about, because there was a book, Silver Burdett put out a book called, they, they had, it was, every, every glee club sang those songs in 1890 something, I don't know, 18 whatever. But they were all that kind of glee songs like, college songs to what we call today, pep songs or something. I think most people think today that it just means happy. Yeah, yeah, but a glee is a type of song. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look that up because that, that has always baffled me, the certain, because there were quartets, there were serenaders, but if you were a glee club, you were different, you know. Uh, also, they had instructors. A glee club was like a cornet band because you had a professor. And, and you were teaching, and they would, they would raise money to hire music teachers as a, a serenaders or a quartet, just sang on the street, you know, the way street corner singers sing. But a glee club was kind of a quasi-organized group of singers singing, like you said, a certain type of song. Thanks for that bit of, a, that bit of information. Yeah. Um, if, if I was supposed to hear more of your music, do I, do I look you up on YouTube? Yeah, you can look me up on YouTube. You can Google my name. Uh, sometimes it's Lem Shepherd or Lemuel Shepherd. I only have one CD <laughs> that I've ever put out, and I'm not, I'm not sure why that is. All my friends put out CDs every year, um, and I'm not, I'm not sure why that is. Even my, my two sons have recording studios. I just I like playing live. Does that I, one bring in good money for you? What's that? Does that one CD bring in good money for you? Not today. <laughs> Once you put it out there today, um, it's free to everybody. Yeah. It's free. But I did learn something because the money I was making off the CD, I put a, I put a song on there, Follow the Drinking Gourd. It's one of the old spirituals. And that song sells more than the CD. So if I do get a, a check for $300 or I think I have like maybe $5 waiting for me. There on the, it's because that song gets downloaded the most. And that's that's what happens. You put a CD out there and people can download. So I did learn, which is why I do a lot of these more spiritual type songs because that song sells more than all the other songs on the CD. So that, that was really worth a lesson there. Yeah. It's strange that there's, there's so many more blacks in Kansas City, Missouri than in Kansas City, Kansas. I know, you know, and I'm not sure. I, I think it's Kansas was part of slave state. I, I know, I know the migration kept going there. And Kansas at one time had 17,000. And I, I think the opening Missouri, uh, Oklahoma Territory just drained the whole population. Not all of it, but every, there was a lot of newspaper articles that stated that they would say, and they would use words like all the, all the black people in this country, which I mean this part of the state, have all left. Because they were promised land, they, were, they paid more for an acre of land or, or a section of land, a little quarter that they could have bought a lot more for. Um, so they were taken advantage of, and then some of them came back I don't know what happened in crop failures in 1899 or 91 or whatever. Some of them came back impoverished. Like one guy was a policeman in Topeka in 1888 or 1890, and he cashed it all in to go to Oklahoma. There was a woman that had, they said she had $25 left on her house payment. She sold the house for $25 just to go to Oklahoma and get in on this thing. So that was the enthusiasm to leave. They weren't like leaving Kansas. They were going to be part of this big thing that was happening. Yeah, yeah, and they thought Oklahoma was going to be a black state, that the, that the president was giving it away to black people. So they all left, with, and they were told that by people who were taking their money. Yeah, you had a question? In the 1900s, were there church choirs that did tours? They were, ju yeah, that's a good question. They were jubilee. The jubilee singers were community groups. They were professional groups. And they, they toured and they made money. And they always used to say, we're raising money for the AME church or we're raising money for this or for that. But the church choirs, 
I don't ever remember seeing that they would tour. They would, now they would get programs, local programs. Like if there's an AME church, they would give a program or a Baptist church, they would give a program, a local program, but the groups that traveled through on the trains were these professional groups. Because see, the Fist Jubilee Singers made a lot of money. And everybody, as soon as they became aware that they raised, I think $200,000, you know, to help build, you know, the, music, the college, you know, once that money thing. And then somebody wrote in the paper that they figured that the Fist Jubilee Singers, because you got to think about these, these halls were like maybe a thousand people could fit in these small halls all over the state. Every little town had one. So you could get a ticket for 25 cents. They could fill the hall up and play every night. So you're talking $300 a night in a time when $300 is a good sum of money to make in a year. And so, these, so everybody started seeing the money signs and they had, a, had an advanced man and he would travel ahead of you on the train and, and arrange this. And I, d I found a, a group that traveled through Kansas and I looked at their tour schedule. It was grueling for that time of period. I, it was through November, December. It was 50 or 60 shows, you know, but they had a train, you get off the train, you get a wagon, you get to the hall, you play the hall, you get back on the train and they played all over Kansas. Little some of these towns that I got some of this information from out of the newspaper, they're basically a, a historic marker today. Some are just in the middle of a, if you look at Google Maps, you can see it's in the middle of a farm, like a, a 10,000 acre you know, piece of land. But at one time there was a, a, a hall there, there's a newspaper. So that's so much has changed, you know. But, but anyway, yeah, the church choirs would give programs locally, but the town itself would maybe have a group of people from all the churches would be a group of Jubilee singers and they were out trying to make money because it was a big, it was all the rage. Like that song, Hand Me Down My Walking Cane. We've heard a song called, uh, uh, they called the Possum Song uh, that a lot of bands played. They were patterned after the Jubilee songs because people like Jubilee songs so much that the songwriters started writing songs, you know, like uh, boil that cabbage down or boil that, boil that cabbage down. And, Almost all the popular songs of the day sounded like a Jubilee song. They borrowed that, you know, Go Down Moses was borrowed. You know, they called that the possum song. And I, I could have sang that song for you, but a lot of songs were borrowing Jubilee songs to make hit songs out of for themselves. But yeah, there was a lot of money, you know, $300 a day for a group. I don't know what it cost to travel and all that, but it was a good living. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you.